Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first session. So we'll have uh, three talks in that session. First talk, semantic matching against Corbus, new application and method presented by Lucy Len. So the talk will be for 20 minutes. Thank you. Sweet. Can everyone hear me OK? Awesome. Thanks. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Lucy, and I'm going to be talking about uh, oh, if it will come back. Uh, semantic matching against text corpora. And this is uh, in collaboration with Scott Miles and Noah Smith at the University of Washington. So uh, we've clearly made a lot of rec um, recent advances in modeling sentential semantics, like um, a lot of the NLI tasks, um, semantic similarity, paraphrase, et cetera. And so what we're going to propose is that a natural thing to do is to match uh, natural language propositions against the corpus. And what we, we see um, end use, possible end users as, for example, a historian of science being interested in tracking the idea of vaccines cause autism. You might expect a spike in that um, in news after, say, the Andrew Wakefield article about that. Um, similarly, uh, political scientists might be interested in how um, different framings of policy issues occur or public servants um, dealing with uh, recovery after natural disasters might be interested in um, ideas about well-being or recovery. So this is kind of the use case we imagine, um, where a user specifies a query like dealing with authorities is causing stress and anxiety. Uh, we would query the corpus, return a list of matched sentences. For example, those in charge of recovery are making moves to appease um, anger among homeowners. And at the end of the talk, I'll briefly touch on what we might be able to do with a list of matched sentences, which is to maybe have it like proxy measurement across a variable like time. So, and this is kind of related to, as I mentioned, um, work on entailment, semantic similarity. Um, but there's also related work in information retrieval, specifically passage retrieval for question answering. And also um, kind of on the measurement side, uh, it's in similar spirit to dynamic topic models and related work. Um, so how this is going to go, um, I'm going to kind of formalize this a little bit and then talk about two different applications, one which, in which we use examples from a code book, um, and this is kind of the media framing uh, domain, and then a second in which we have our domain expert, Scott, um, specify uh, queries of ideas that he's interested in in disaster recovery, and then we did a user study to um, validate that and see if there are other interested in any users. Um, and finally, I'll briefly discuss this um, using the output for measurement idea. So um, basically, as inputs, um, we would have a corpus of sentences, which we'll say C, and a proposition query containing the idea of interest, which we'll call SP. Um, and we'll just <coughs> treat these as sentences. Um, we're not going to consider document structure in this work, but would be interesting in future work. Um, and what we would like to do is basically score all of these sentences S and C such that um, the score should be high if and only if S expresses the proposition query SP. And from there, you can get the top end sentences and um, return out an output list. So I'm going to talk about this first um, application um, where uh, we're going to use the media frames corpus, um, which is contains thousands of articles about different policy issues. The one we're going to focus on is immigration. And spans of text are annotated with different framing dimensions. And this could be, these are things like um, if the issue is cast in legal terms, in economic terms, quality of life, and so on. And we also have the annotation codebook for that corpus. And we're <laughs> going to take 30 annotation codebook examples as the ideas of interest. And one example of this is immigration rules have changed on fair labor time, which invokes this kind of framing of fairness and equality with relation to immigration immigration. Um, and so the idea basically is that um, if we match a sentence, uh, uh, if we match an example sentence from the codebook, then it should, um, it should evoke the frame that we're expecting, that it's an example of. And just as a side note, there are many ways to evoke a frame outside the codebook, so we're not really looking for um, like high recall at all. Um, we're just kind of looking at precision here. So um, because we're um, evoking frames and it's kind of like a broad category, we're going to use a really simple scoring function. And basically what we're going to do is um, each sentence we're going to represent it as the average of its, of its word vectors. And then we're going to take the cosine similarity between the two sentence vectors 
and that's going to be the scoring function. <laughs> um, and we use um, we tried out two different word vector variants that are pre-trained. Um, one are paraphrastic word vectors by whiting et al. And these are trained on the PPDB. They're kind of designed to be used in these sorts of similarity tasks. And the other is the very well-known word to vec um, pre-trained on Google News. And the nice thing about these is that because they're trained on um, such large data, they might have a lot of entities we're interested in. So we're interested in how well does our um, output line up with the corpus annotations. So we look at this at the sentence level where if we match um, if we match a sentence, does the frame line up with the, um, the annotated frame? And what we find is basically that um, the paraphrastic vectors do better than the word to vec vectors, which in turn do better than just a TF-IDF baseline. Um, and so we're not really looking for, there are clearly probably better methods to do this to get much higher precision, but um, this is kind of a first step and does reasonably well given how simple it is. So, there we go. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about um, matching more specific queries. And this is going to be in a domain um, where researchers and public servants don't necessarily have a lot of um, empirical data, and they want to understand what challenges the community is facing as kind of a post-mortem, post-disaster um, sort of work. And so our thinking is that we can use, um, use these techniques to find relevant sentences um, from which they can um, from which they can learn from, and so we're going to specifically focus on the Canterbury earthquakes, New Zealand from 2010-2011. Um, we pulled a corpus of, um, sorry, of about a thousand news articles um, that are local uh, from local news sources, and we as. Um, ideas of interest, we had our domain expert, Scott, provi um, provide 20 queries that he was inter he's interested in for his own work. And these are things covering community well-being, infrastructure, decision-making, uh, utilities, so on. Um, for example, the council should have consulted residents before making decisions. Seems obvious. Apparently, it's not to certain governments. And so um, in this case, unlike in the framing case, we're really interested in kind of more fine grain matching. We really want to match this idea. And so because of that, we're going to here um, use a more entailment sort of model. Um, it's going to be based on syntax. And I'm going to walk through it very quickly. <laughs> um, so given two sentences, um, the candidate sentence from the corpus and the uh, proposition query, we're going to get the dependency parses of each. We're then going to find a sequence of what we're calling tree edit operations, which transform one tree into the other. And so the intuition basically is that the difference between the two sentences is somehow indicative of the relationship between the two. If it's if they match each other, if they don't, um, and this syntactic transformation is one way of kind of getting at that. And to be more clear, um, we can take this example where um, we start with the sentence "unfamiliar bureaucratic systems are causing stress," and we want to find a set of transformations um, such that. We end up with this tree at the bottom. And so you might want to delete a couple of the words, relabel, and then finally insert to get the end tree. And I'm not going to go into details about how we do this, but it's basically a greedy search. Um, from there, we use that sequence as um, features into a classifier. Um, the original paper from Heilman Smith that we worked off of. Uh, use the logistic regression classifier um, with kind of based on counts of features. Um, this is 2018, so we're going to also put it into a neural network because it's a sequence, and we should do that. Um, and we just trained it on SNLI, um, Stanford Natural Infer Natural Language Inference Corpus, um, and just kind of on a two-class entail versus neutral contradiction. And so to make this run in a reasonable amount of time, we first um, do this, this fast word vector based matching on, um, on the entire corpus, obtain some subset of matches from which we then run this entailment based model. And we tried out different combinations of this. So to evaluate, we surveyed 20 emergency managers and um, took the output of the different um, systems and had them rate from one to five how good of a match they were to compare to the query. 
So an example that we show them um, is there's a shortage of construction workers. And so one is like, this is not really expressing the idea at all to five, which is, hey, this is great. Um, and so what we see is that on the left are, the left two are basically, um, we use the parafastic uh, vectors in this like first pass filter. And then um, they're kind of between the two sides, there are the um, logistic, logistic regression LSTM versions of the um, syntax-based model. And in general, uh, the parafastic vectors, again, do better than the work effect ones. And this makes a difference on kind of like what you do afterwards. Um, basically, if you have kind of mediocre output from that first pass, you're not really going to make things better. We also um, asked respondents if they're just interested in this um, application in general. Most of them said yes, which is great. Um, we, and then half of them were actually interested in a follow-up study, which is in progress. And basically, we're having them specify their own idea queries. And so it's kind of like this back and forth study, which is cool. Um, so finally, I'm going to talk about um, using this sort of matching output in a different, um, sorry, using this output in like a measurement. And what I mean by that is, say we have this um, query uh, dealing with the stories is causing stress and anxiety that I've been kind of using throughout this talk. And um, if we take... It was supposed to be fixed. <laughs> it's okay. There we go. Um, if we take uh, <coughs> the top 50 sentences, we look at the metadata for the articles they came from. Um, they're published on a certain date, um, which kind of indicates, oh, hey, this idea is showing up at this time. And if, so if we, if we bin this in three months, we get the following um, histogram. And uh, so we show this to Scott, and he was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, that's kind of worrisome, unfortunately. They're, they're trying to fix it. <laughs> it's like when in doubt, reboot. Um, and basically, uh, after the earthquake happens, which was kind of 2011-ish, um, people are still kind, they're still feeling okay about the fact that they're getting help, the government's being involved in um, giving aid in terms of recovery, services, etc. And as time goes on, um, worry and stress starts to set in because um, their needs aren't being fulfilled or they feel like they're being forgotten. And then so that translates into um, subsequent coverage. So uh, some things that we found from both studies um, that kind of motivate future work um, are, one, the complexity of the idea. Um, so sometimes queries that are too general, too specific, that impacts the kinds of um, match sentences you get. And also, can we give user guidance for maybe writing better queries? Uh, so that's kind of a progress with this uh, follow-up study. So another problem we kind of ran into was entity slash co-reference. Um, this is particularly interesting in the New Zealand earthquake um, data because a lot of those entities just, they don't, they're local. They don't really show up in our news. Um, an example of this is Sarah, which is the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority. And it's apparently also the last name of an actor who uh, I didn't know existed. Um, <laughs> Finally, uh, they're just the fact that we're using, um, we're kind of breaking off sentence boundaries uh, is, a, is, is a limiting factor. Um, so in two ways, one, the surrounding context can invalidate a match. And secondly, a potential match can be kind of spread across the sentence boundary, so we'll miss it. And so this, um, so in future work, um, it would be interesting to incorporate that or document structure, so on. So yeah. Yeah, so uh, just to wrap up, um, in this talk, we showed the kind of viability of different semantic matching methods in two di pretty different application domains. Uh, we performed a user study to uh, establish some end user interest, at least in this particular application, and motivated future work on semantic matching and other measurement applications. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned 
question, what is the next step is to ask people to write good queries. How do you evaluate what is better query and what is not a good query? Sure. So um, you're asking basically, um, so how we're how we're getting them to write, to write better queries and how we might evaluate that. Just evaluate the quality of your query. Yeah. So we're so in this follow study, we're not. Um, we're ba we basically ask them like, what would you like? What would you write um, as a query without being without giving suggestions? And they're they're actually somewhat different from the ones that Scott provided. Um, and so, it's probably going to be more of this back and forth thing of us seeing how well um, what kind of output we get from these new queries, um, how well they score in terms of like it, the expected output that they want to see. And then going back and being like, oh, well, maybe you should simplify this um, in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. More questions? Do we have time? Uh, this is about your complexity about when you find entities with the same name. I think uh -huh. this is going to be a problem across a lot of uh, NLP. Uh, yes. What is your guys' idea for handling that in the next project? So the question is how we plan on handling kind of um, entities that share the same name, um, but maybe just appear in different domains. Um, I'm not sure yet, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I mean, one thing we can think about is kind of uh, getting a small amount of label data in the target domain and then doing a little bit of domain adaptation -y sort of stuff to make that perhaps less of a problem. Um, but that's all still kind of in progress. Any more questions? I, I have, oh, maybe I'm not live. <laughs> uh, just an interesting, or maybe more of a comment. Yeah. Um, one thing that might be interesting to play with is there's a uh, corpus of CNN and Daily Mail articles, if you've encountered that. that I've seen it. Okay, yeah. so they have the highlights of the article right. and then the article itself. And so it's an abstractive <laughs> sentence that could relate to that. That could be a fun. Right. Yeah, some training data. Yeah. So I guess the comment, um, if people didn't hear, was that um, the CNN Daily Mail corpus would be an interesting um, thing to apply this to. Um, yeah. So I have a question regarding the. Uh, Compositional word vectors, you added the word vectors together for composing the sentence. Did you try any other method for composition? Um, so the question is if we tried other methods besides just kind of simple addition of the word vectors in the um, kind of that basic word vector matching. So, and um, so this it was kind of motivated by um, that whiting paper which, in which they had found that. Um, simpler averaging for their vectors had actually worked better than using running it through like an LSTM or something. Um, I think they since have um, subsequent results which um, have kind of modified that, and so I would probably try something else in the future. Um, but one thing that's nice about it is just how, really how simple it is, and it still gives a decent signal. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Oh, thank you. Synthetic and natural noise post brick neural machine translation by Unitem Shift. So, uh, so hi, um, this is some joint work I'll be presenting that I did with, uh, so I'm Yonatan, sorry, I'm doing, this is joint work with Yonatan. And, um, the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is our, our talk, uh, Synthetic and Natural Noise Both Break Neural Machine Translation. What I've gone ahead and done for you here is I've just left in where the spell checker has decided there's an error. So that's all these red lines. Um, and, and the beautiful thing is you might be thinking, well, maybe people make typos. These are actually all real mistakes that people have made. So uh, what we did, this is uh, from a wiki edits corpus. So I just went ahead and swapped in the mistakes that people make. And you might be thinking, well, not to worry, machine translation is, uh, is, is really robust, uh, you know, spell checkers are really robust. First, I'll, I'll run that and see what, what it fixes. So um, not to worry, what we end up with is a much better version. So synthetic ant natural noise doth break neural machine translation. 
Um, and it's also figured out my pseudonym, which is Yucatan Busk. Um, so we've made a lot of progress here. Um, it's also much more Shakespearean, which I feel like gives it a sort of gravitas that was missing from the title. Um, so, so clearly, spell checking is sort of not perfect. It's, it's nice. In English, in particular, we have a lot of uh, did you mean kind of data. So that really helps. And then obviously, here's the actual title. Here are our actual names. So the, the sort of basic uh, you know, place where this situates in the literature right is in this context of things like adversarial examples. And we're very familiar with this kind of classic example from the vision literature, right? where you have an image which was classified as a panda. You add what is seemingly sort of imperceptible noise, and now you have a misclassification. And the question becomes sort of what does that look like uh, for natural language? And what's sort of important, important, right, is that the noise distorts the perceptual process in some way, but it doesn't actually hinder the semantic understanding. So maybe you did notice that the second image was a little bit blurrier, but it didn't actually affect your ability to understand what it was. And this is not atypical, right, of our perceptual system. So for example, our eyes all saccade all over the place all, over the, uh, all the time. And to sort of give you a little bit of that, this is not in the paper, but some work we've been doing since then, uh, if you take... Some, uh, some text, you uh, go ahead and introduce the same kind of errors that I showed earlier. So here we have a lawsuit was filed March 27th, and the preliminary investigation was opened by the prosecutors. First of all, it's important to note that no one has any trouble reading this. And just to prove that point, we went ahead and run an eye tracker. So we have people sit down, and they're actually reading the sentence. So we have, they sort of fixate here. They jump a little bit, move forward an entire phrase, backtrack, uh, and then move through the rest of the sentence. The, the only reason this is really important is that there are 14 words, there are nine fixations. Um, so when people are reading this text and we actually have them answering questions at the end to make sure that they did comprehend the text, uh, they're not paying a lot of attention to a lot of the words. In fact, based off of what we know about how much you see when you look at a specific part of the, uh, of the sentence, what had probably happened in this fixation is they saw the entire word completely skipped was and then moved on. Right? So they probably didn't even notice, which we see, for instance, there's some interesting work in the psych literature where you interview people, didn't even notice that there was an error there. And we do this all the time. right? We make mistakes in our own writing. We then reread it and totally miss it. We need a new pair of eyes to notice it. Uh, so, so perception is a, sort of fundamentally noisy and sparse. And so maybe the reason that we aren't disturbed by these kinds of adversarial examples is because we've been sort of training on it our entire lives. Another place you might be training on these things is messy handwriting, right? Your entire life you're trying to decipher doctor's notes or other kinds of things maybe your child wrote. You may your, yourself have really messy handwriting. And so I went ahead and did some, some research. I went online and I searched. And it looks at like if you have messy handwriting, you might have emotional baggage. So that, you know, just, just take that home. On the other hand, I did continue searching. And if you go further down in the results, you might also be a genius. So it's a little unclear what the research shows there. But either way, you've probably been exposed to noisy text throughout your life. So what we're doing in this setup is I'm just going to give you like the super quick. We have a bunch of models, which we're going to test and see how brittle they are um, and how noise affects them. So first, we use Nematis, which is a machine translation uh, uh, framework, which uh, performed very well in a bunch of uh, WMT uh, tasks from last year. It's a BPE-based representation. So if you're not familiar, that just means that instead of using words as input, it's sort of finding uh, sets of uh, characters. That, so for instance, like a morphological ending, like ing, gets chunked out. So this is a really helpful way of increasing robustness to out of vocabulary effects. We're then also going to use uh, this uh, work from Tackle last year, Char to Char. Uh, this is a very impressive model that doesn't even take into account uh, segmentation information. So it just treats the entire input as one big character stream and then, and then translates to characters. And then uh, finally, just as a simple baseline, what you might code up in an afternoon. So this is kind of your sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence model with attention and character-based convolutions for the representation. So it's not super important. The thing to keep in mind is just that uh, this final model here has notions of what word boundaries are, but looks at individual characters. Uh, this model doesn't even care about word boundaries. Um, and this top model has maybe slightly more intelligent ways of figuring out sort of uh, morphological units and so forth. And then for the data, we're going to use a spoken text corpus. So there, for uh, the IWSLT competition a couple years back, they had a bunch of these TED Talks in their translations. And so that's where we're going to do the evaluation and then also some of the training I'll show you. 
So first, let's talk about synthetic errors. So the beauty of adversarial examples that exist, for instance, in the vision literature is that you basically can just sample random noise. So what would that look like for us if we wanted to just automatically create errors? Well, something we do all the time is we swap two letters, right? You're typing, you type too quickly, you flip two letters. So we're going to restrict that to being in longer words and only in the middle of the word to sort of make it a little easier, but noise goes to nosy or something. Um, there's a meme that you might remember from many years back. According to research at Cambridge, if you scramble all the letters in this word or something to this effect, you can still read it as long as the first and the last letters stay put. So we're going to pretend like the internet knows things, and we're going to go ahead and, and follow the meme for our second type of noise. Uh, third, what if we just ignore that and randomly permute all the letters in the word? And then finally, all the time, we end up hitting a key by accident. So what happens if we swap one of the letters with one which is within a radius one key on the keyboard? And uh, the effect of this on these two, on the sort of the two pre-trained, you know, state-of-the-art fancy models is that as you change the number of tokens that are permuted um, or that are, are messed up, uh, you see the, the blue scores drop off. Not terribly surprising. Um, and what we see, for example, is that by the time we get to something like 20%, we've actually lost uh, you know, almost half of our performance, right? 10% um, is even is, is still a pretty steep drop off in both of these models. So it doesn't take a lot to mess with translation. I'll come back to what we might do about it a little bit later. The second thing you might ask is, well, these are some nice synthetic results. What does it look like if we actually try to use real noise? So I said we have some wiki edits and stuff like this. So uh, it turns out that there are some, some beautiful uh, people out there that have created these, these collections of sort of second language speakers in there and edits to them writing essays, um, Wikipedia, Corpora, stuff like this. And so we can go and we can find a bunch of naturally occurring errors in the wild, and then we can use them to permute our text. Uh, I don't speak a word of German, but I'm told that um, what's going on here is that, for instance, we have phonetic distinctions like T and D, S and Z are getting, getting uh, screwed up. Uh, we have dropped letters like the uh, T missing and babysitter here. Um, and then we kind of get into the more interesting space, which is things like morphological problems, right? So where someone has has conjugated something incorrectly. This is the kind of stuff where if we really want to be able to do this automatically, we're going to have to have a much str maybe stronger notion of linguistics to do it than the kind of simple errors I was presenting before. So the question becomes, um, do these errors affect our models in the same way that our synthetic errors do? Yes. So all I've done here is I've gone ahead and superimposed um, the, the, this is the natural error line on both of these, it's just a hair better. So maybe it's the case that there are certain types of errors that are less likely to be made than uh, just willy-nilly swapping um, or randomizing of letters. So for example, maybe people are less likely to mess up a capitalization. Maybe people are less likely to mess up, uh, you know, they, they may choose the wrong conjugation, but at least it's a valid conjugation, these kinds of things, right? So there's, a, there's a quite a bit more exploration that's necessary there. The other thing is that we don't have full token coverage because for example, we just don't have errors for every single word. So this, this maxes out at about 40%. Okay, so as I started with though, we have spell checkers. So like, obviously I said they're not perfect, but like, they're probably like not terrible. So here's what happens with our French, uh, German, and Czech models if we just introduce a bunch of natural errors. So here are our blue scores. And here's what happens if we just select the first spell checker suggestion for every single word in the, in the, in the scrambled, or excuse me, in the error filled corpus. So, what you first note is that first, uh, French and German, we are seeing pretty significant gains, something to the tune of five to six uh, blue points. So, spell checkers are doing something. The other thing, though, that I should, I should mention is that in the case of French and German, you're only seeing typically one to two suggestions from the spell checker for each one of those recommendations. That is not the case for Czech, right? So when you look at the Czech errors, what ends up happening is you have this insane list of all the things that could possibly happen. Um, again, I don't speak any Czech, so I just picked the first one. Um, and it turns out that actually on average, I made things worse. So uh, that's sort of not, you know, maybe for uh, the small error condition, given sufficient context or rich, uh, spell checker will be beneficial, but those are also going to break down. And then just as a reminder, these are still quite a bit different from what it would be like if you just trained and tested on clean text. So, excuse me, so now let's try to see if we can do maybe something about robustness. So what about training with noise? 
So there's way too many numbers, and so if you're really bored, we've just put charts and charts in the paper. So I'm going to try to synthesize a couple of quick lessons from it. So one is, if I train on noisy text, but, I but then I test on clean, unadulterated text, how do I do? So here what we've done is, these are the different types, so vanilla is completely clean, here are the different types of noise that I mentioned earlier, and here's what happens if I sort of ensemble some of the noise. And uh, for French and Czech, so that this doesn't get too cluttered, uh, here's sort of ideally where we would like to be, this, uh, these lines, and how well are the models actually doing. And the thing that I want to point out is that the natural errors are actually quite a bit harder for some reason. So despite the fact that we, um, you know, he, this, is, this is insane, right? Here I've literally scrambled the entire word, um, and that doesn't affect the model as much when testing on the original data as when I introduce natural errors. So there's something that we still need to investigate there. Another thing, though, that is somewhat heartening is that, you know, at least once you take the natural and you add other noise to it, um, then the model becomes sort of more generally robust. Uh, another thing that I'll point out very quickly is what happens if you test on all different types of noise. So here what I've done is we've trained on a specific type of noise, and then I'm presenting the average blue across five different types of noise for testing. So, um, for instance, just to make this concrete, here we just do the letter swap inside of those words, but the blue score here is when you test on swap, middle, random, keyboard, natural. So all of those and then, and then average. The first thing that I'd like to point out is that the model does seem in some sense to have a robustness, uh, there's sort of, there's a direction of robustness, right? So if a model is trained on words that are totally randomized, then it does better on average, including on things that were, that where it just sees swaps than if it only see, if it sees less noise. And this seems to sort of, um, hold over to the ensemble case, right? So once I throw just tons and tons of different to noise at it, the model seems to do the best sort of overall. Um, all right, so what you would like to do, right? So if I was sort of like amazing at cognitive modeling, somehow I would build a model which not only took into account noise, but also just like was impervious to it, just didn't care. We tried a bunch of fancy things and they didn't work, and I can talk about self-attention-y type things later. So what ended up sort of seeming to be fine was, let's just try the mean character representation. So if I have a model whose word representation is just literally the average of the vectors for all the characters, then it doesn't matter what order they're in, right? So like it's by definition um, resilient to this. Um, so there's the good news. It means that I can train on completely clean text with no errors. I can present it completely scrambled text and it still does okay. It's like a 20% hit, not the end of the world. And then the thing that's not surprising to anybody in this room who's ever thought about language is that there are morphologically rich languages for which turns out you really don't want to just average all the characters. There's something in the structure of the word. So that's, that's clearly not the solution. As one final note though, so I, th I do want ideally to be able to move in this direction, right? I'd like to be in a situation where models are sort of more inherently robust. And so one thing we wanted to do is at least kind of analyze what the filters of the model were learning uh, when we're sort of showing at various types of noise. So it's a little bit hard to interpret all of this, but let me just sort of figure, um, focus on one point. This is what happens if you look at the weights in all of the filters that are learned for the character embeddings in our models when they're trained in these four different settings. With keyboard errors, natural errors, completely randomized um, ordering of the letters in the word, and the ensemble. Note that these have a pretty high variance, right? So you're learning different, so different filters are going to be firing for different settings, for different environments. And then note that when you train on random, they've completely collapsed. And so what we think is happening here is that basically when you completely randomize the input like that, the model's basically rediscovering that mean character model from before. It's basically giving up on trying to learn structure, and so it just takes some sort of an average of everything that's in it and then moves forward. So that seems to be kind of like a baseline default. Maybe we're even doing something like that, but we have additional systems which can trigger if we're not understanding, right? So we can reason about things, we can sort of piece together uh, how we might unscramble a word and so forth. So that's kind of where we'd like to move in terms of future research. Thanks. We have time for questions. 
thanks for a great talk so uh, have you thought about w- what would be in this scenario an adversarial noise like what would really screw up the system like uh, for the image processing there were like random would sometimes screw up is there like an adversarial thing which will really so it depends on what you mean so there's kind of two versions of adversarial right so one is can you just break all these systems like obviously you can break all these systems um, what we didn't do that we played around a little bit it's just very time consuming um, there are cases right where if I change one of the letters I will change the translation and so it's quite possible that some of the if I wanted to trick a translation system, for example, into saying something in particular, I might be able to make some changes on the input, which would cause that, but to which the, the human wouldn't think of as, as affecting it. And that's, I think, sort of the ideal adversarial case. I don't have a great uh, uh, notion for it. We tried to do that manually, and we were able to find some examples. I don't have a pipeline at, as of yet, but I think that would be, yeah, it'd be awesome if you could come up with these kinds of, these kinds of examples. Yeah. Hi, great talk. Uh, I'm Ann Kao from Boeing. We deal with a lot of very noisy text data. For example, uh, mechanics of the world maintain the airplane and they write poorly. So really interesting your talk. So uh, did you try to deal with uh, abbreviations that chop off some of the letters? And sometimes they insert letters too. Uh, yeah, so we didn't explicitly though, I think I actually skipped it. One of the, the um, there are, not exactly abbreviations, but definitely omissions is pretty common in the uh, edit corpora. So it is pretty common for people to just to completely miss a letter, for example, um, which is kind of starts to get at this. Um, but no, particularly for instance, in an, in, um, an abbreviation, you have even less to go on. So uh, I don't. I, I suspect it would just make everything even even harder. But I don't have an answer to what to. Well, I don't have an answer to do what to do about any of this. But um, <laughs> but I but I don't. Yeah. Um, that's a great. That's a great problem. Also, do you have a sense how much misspelled words involved before you were really not able to do as well, percentage-wise in a sentence? Yeah. So it's it becomes very clear. So we all we all have our experiences with machine translation, right? Where we run something through, and then we even even in the Best of cases, we still have to do some detective work to figure out what was actually intended, right? So in that sense, yeah, even at like that 10% mark, if I'm just if I'm just basically imagine you have a sentence and now two of those words have have been, are, are something randomly new, the detective work becomes very very difficult to figure out what was actually going on. Um, I there's a, there's an example, for instance, in the paper where we run one of these kind of fully scrambled things through Google Translate and you kind of get out and then and also the output from these other systems and you get out these sentences and in some cases the models default to sort of copying they're like oh well I'll just take the German straight through and just hand it back to you um, and in some cases you get what its attempt is at a sentence is just that it's completely meaningless by you know it has no bearing to what was originally there so I, I think the answer is probably not a lot and maybe a spell checker will be able to help you but I also want to note that there's a huge difference between spell checkers, right? So there's a difference between, like for instance, the Google Translate uh, spell checking that we were doing here, and if you run like a spell on your Unix machine. Um, th- so, so having some sort of central context is really important to being able to address those errors. Yeah. OK, any more questions? For your corpus of uh, natural errors, I noticed you had some that were uh, the Wikipedia uh, typos that were probably from native speakers, but then you also had uh, language learners. Right. Uh, and from a linguistic standpoint, the errors made by language learners tend to be rather different from native. So I was wondering if you looked into how those differ and, and anything about that. Um, no, unfortunately, we were mostly focused on just finding these errors. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, in the case of um, I have to double check the details. I think in the case of the German and the Czech, those are both language learners. Um, and then in the case of French and English, those are Wikipedia edits. And I think that's partially just an issue uh, I mean, as its availability, right? Um, there just isn't as much of, of that kind of stuff. But I think that that's another sort of fascinating thing, right, is that if we were to build these models, ideally that are robust, we'd like to be able to introduce these kinds of errors, but that would require someone to have first collected or found all these kinds of things. And as, as resources, you know, as the language becomes not English, um, <laughs> resources, you know, go to, so yeah. Thank you.
So the third talk in this uh, session by Swapa, she will talk about syntactic scaffold for semantic structures. Hi, uh, I'm Swaba. Can you hear me? OK. Um, yeah, and I'll be talking about syntactic scaffolds for semantic structures. And this is uh, work done jointly with my co-authors, Sam, who's right here, and Kenton, Luke, Chris, and Noah, who's right there. Uh, lots of affiliations, literally too many logos. Um, all right, so the task we are interested in is semantic structure prediction. Now, depending on the formalism, the semantic structures may look very different. For example, we have the sentence, Ivanka told Fefe that she is inspiring. Uh, the frame semantics uh, structure for this sentence look like, looks like this. There are two frames of meaning, one about the event telling and another about the event uh, subjective influence. For the telling frame, the speaker is Ivanka, the addressee is Fefe, and the message is that she is inspiring. And uh, for the subjective uh, influence frame, the entity is she, and she is providing the influence. So um, this is what frame semantic structures look like. A different kind of structure is um, given by co-reference, where you have in green all the entities which are present in the sentence, as well as relationships between uh, the word she and Fefe. Hopefully, she refers to Fefe here, not Ivanka. But um, uh, yeah, so this is the kind of structure that you get from co-reference chains. So as you can see, these structures look very different. The frame semantics looks quite different from the core F structure. But what they have in common is uh, the syntactic framework. So for example, we have the, uh, the constituency tree for the sentence, the same sentence. And we can see that uh, the different arguments, speaker is a noun phrase. Addressee is also a noun phrase, and the message is an, uh, is an S bar. So what you can see from here is that uh, if you have the syntactic information of a sentence, it might be easy to get to the semantics of the sentence. Um, and indeed, this has been tried extensively in previous work. So uh, prior work involves using a pipeline where given a sentence, you first do the syntactic processing of the sentence to get the full syntactic tree, use features from that tree to extract the semantic graphs from it. Now, the problem with this is that it is both very expensive, and since uh, you're doing things in a pipeline, you're very likely to uh, cascade errors. If you get the syntax wrong, you're very likely to also get the semantics wrong. Also, the tree that we saw in the previous example is way more complicated, whereas the semantics was relatively simple. Like Jonathan said, when people read sentences, if they are trying to semantically understand the sentences, they need not read through the entire sentence. Some words can be skipped. Some words are semantically vacuous, and so on. So um, using syntax in a pipeline works, but it is probably not the best solution. Now, in um, recent times, people have come up with neural end-to-end -end models, which have completely done away with syntax. So these end-to-end -end models just start with the sentence and try to predict the entire semantic graph from the sentence. Now, uh, even though these models work, uh, regardless of not using syntax, it has not been conclusively shown that syntax does not help further. Uh, in fact, people from Yura Bluheng, who's somewhere over here, uh, showed in her paper that using constraints uh, from gold syntax uh, actually helps. So um, there is still hope for syntax. There is actually a lot of hope. So what we are suggesting in this work is somewhere in between these two worlds. We want to use syntax, but we don't want to go through this whole process of pipelining and um, errors cascading and so on. So what we are suggesting is, called, uh, is this method called syntactic scaffolds, which uses, as the name suggests, <coughs> suggests syntax but does not go through the whole pipelining schwan. All right, so hopefully I introduced the problem to you. 
uh, let's look in detail what these syntactic scaffolds are. So uh, this is essentially a multitask learning setup where one of the tasks is the primary task we are interested in, which is the semantic structured prediction task, frame semantics, or coref in our case. And the second task is syntactic prediction. However, in contrast to your traditional multitask learning setup, where both the tasks are equally important, uh, for us, the syntactic task is a secondary auxiliary task, and the primary task is the semantic task that we are interested in. So multitask learning gives us this advantage um, that we can use shared parameters to learn better contextualized representations for the spans and whatever substructures that are semantically uh, non-vacuous. Um, also, in this setup, as in general multitask learning, we do not need the supervision for the semantics and syntax to come on from the same data set. So we can use two different data sets, one with only semantic annotations, another with only syntactic annotations, and still be able to learn. Uh, which is uh, difficult in your regular pipeline setup because you need the syntax on the same data before you can predict semantics on it. Um, Another thing uh, that the syntactic scaffolds approach offers us is that we do not have to predict this entire complicated syntactic tree with all its bells and whistles. We just have to focus on the substructures in that syntactic tree, which are meaningful for the semantic prediction task. Uh, we look at some of the substructures later on. And finally, um, as the name suggests, it's a scaffold. So it is only used at learning time to learn the model uh, with all the syntactic information uh, in it. And at test time, we can totally discard this and move on. All right. So the learning problem looks something like this. Um, so this is the objective. Equation one shows us the objective. The first term in the objective is the primary uh, objective, the syntactic structured prediction objective, which we will look into later. Uh, and the secondary objective is the scaffold objective. Both are interpolated by this term delta, which is a mixing ratio that uh, tells you how, how do we weight these two objectives. So all you have to do is plug in the scaffolding objective into your semantic task, uh, semantic objective, and you will be able to learn um, uh, information from the syntactic tree bank. And uh, if you look into the objective, what it does is it's a simple logistic regression classifier. It takes uh, all possible spans in the sentence up to a certain length and tries to predict for each span what the synta uh, syntactic substructure of that span could be, whether or not it's a noun phrase, what kind of noun phrase it is, what the uh, parent of the noun phrase could be, and so on. So to formalize it, the, uh, different, um, the different substructures we try to predict are phrase identity, whether or not a span is a constituent phrase or a syntactic phrase, uh, the phrase type of the span, and if the span is not a syntactic phrase, we predict null. The phrase type and the parent phrase type um, of the span. This uh, parent phrase type is the uh, constituent which immediately um, uh, precedes it in the tree. And uh, special phrase types, such as noun phrase and prepositional phrase. That is, given a span, whether or not it is a noun phrase or a prepositional phrase. And we do this because a lot of these arguments, as we saw the name Savanka, Fefe, they were noun phrases. And a lot of um, semantic arguments tend to be noun phrases. Uh, a lot of semantic arguments tend to be prepositional phrases, and so on. OK. So let's look at some of the, uh, the two downstream tasks that we uh, incorporated this framework in. The first one is frame semantics. Um, so again, this is what a frame semantic graph looks like. We are using the FrameNet corpus, um, which uh, was proposed, which was created at Berkeley. And um, in this particular work, we only uh, focus on the task of identifying and labeling these spans. So given a sentence, as well as uh, the frames in the sentence, that is, if we know that there is a frame telling 
in the sentence? And if we know there is a frame subjective influence in the sentence, are we able to predict what the arguments for those frames are? And um, these frame identification and um, um, also target identification tasks are relatively uh, straightforward and have been solved previously with high accuracy, but argument labeling and argument identification are difficult tasks. So we focus only on that. Um, as a baseline, we use this model called semi-Markov CRFs, which is uh, a generalization of a CRF. So the generalization only comes from the simple fact that um, you have to predict, for a given sentence, you predict a segmentation of the sentence. So in a general CRF, each segment is of the same fixed length, which is typically one. Uh, a semi-Markov CRF offers you the freedom of um, wearing the length, modeling also the length of the segment that you're predicting. So this works very well for our case because arguments can have arbitrary lengths. Um, so this is a natural fit for uh, the task of frame semantic parsing. Uh, without going into too many details, uh, I'll just say that we uh, focus on spans up to length d. So if you had to model every possible span in the sentence uh, of length n, you would uh, run into O of n square complexity, and we pare it down to O of n d because we only limit ourselves to spans of length d. And um, the factor L comes from the different possible uh, labels that you could label a span with. All right, and to model the spans themselves, we use an architecture like this. This is from uh, co-authors, Kenton and Luke Luang. Um, so uh, how this model works is given a sentence. We first get the pre-trained embeddings for that sentence. We use glove here. We pass it through to uh, bi-directional LSTMs to get the contextualized um, now representations of each token in the sentence. Uh, these are given by the yellow embeddings. Um, and to represent a span, what we do is we take the first word in the span and the last word and concatenate the hidden representation of both words. Um, and we also use this head finding mechanism that uh, finds the head, or it uses a simple attention mechanism to figure out what word in the span uh, carries um, the most uh, syntactic information. And um, that is given by the red nodes over there. And the final span representation is given as the green vectors. OK, so all we do in the scaffolded frame SRL is plug in uh, this objective. So the primary objective is shown on top. It is a simplified, it's a modified uh, log likelihood objective. And all we do now is use the same span representations or use the same parameters to learn these span representations and plug in uh, the scaffolding objective. The scaffolding um, uh, uh, objective is trained on onto nodes data, which is built on uh, top of Pentry Bank, and uh, the primary objective is trained on FrameNet. So here, uh, since we have two different corpora, we, we, we can uh, get by even though there is no data overlap. All right, so looking at some results, our baseline um, semi-CRF model gets a significant um, improvement over previous state-of-the-art models. And as we add these different scaffolding models, we keep on seeing improvements. So this shows that adding syntactic information is still useful. And the best model that we have, which is shown in gray, is uh, this particular um, scaffolding model, which uh, takes a span and predicts whether or not it should be a noun phrase or a prepositional phrase. So uh, getting very specific is seen to help. All right, uh, I'll quickly go over the next task, which is co-reference resolution. This is also a span-based task. And um, uh, so we use this model from Kenton and others where uh, this task is treated as a series of sequence classification tasks. So spans in the sentence are labeled as uh, entities. And uh, also you label for a given entity what is the, uh, the antecedent entity to that uh, particular entity. So this way you can uh, uh, build these simple classification decisions to get entity clusters. 
So again, all we do is, since we are doing a span-based modeling for the co-reference model, we can use the same span representation to uh, make the classification of what kind of syntactic um, span uh, it is. And so it's, again, very simple. Just plug in uh, and interpolate with this delta. Again, we see an improvement when we plug in the scaffolding objective. And uh, the improvement is not as much as we saw in the FrameNet test. And this could be attributed to the fact that we do this, again, on the onto nodes task, where um, uh, the way the co-reference um, Men uh, co-referent mentions were annotated were on top of these syntactic constituents. So you already have that information in the data, and you're reusing the data to learn these syntactic um, uh, constituents. So it is possible that that is why the improvement is not as much. So in summary, we saw that syntax is very useful for semantics, but syntax is expensive. So um, uh, sca scaffolds are an inexpensive alternative that can uh, get the best of both worlds. OK, so what's next? So this is not something that could is um, uh, confined to only semantic tasks. Basically, any task that uses uh, syntactic span information could benefit from such scaffolding. Um, uh, syntactic dependencies could be used as scaffolds too. And finally, you can use semantics as scaffolds for various downstream tasks. So that's all. Thank you. Question? <coughs> this one there. Um, can I ask uh, the differences between the the, the re recurrent neural network together with the classification on top of on top of it and the recursive neural network standard recursive? Neural network? Right. Um, so you can think of recursive neural nets as like a special case for um, of recurrent neural networks. Um, so basically. Um, to build a recursive neural net, you need to know what structure it is modeling, for which you need to know that there is some kind of a syntactic tree, and you will use that syntactic tree to uh, compose together the nodes. But here we are just modeling the sentences. We don't have any information about structure. So we cannot really use recursive neural nets in this case. Uh, but it is another way to represent information like um, these graphical information or tree specific information. Yeah. So if you, uh, great presentation. If you wanted to um, in, enhance w where you were going beyond the uh, frame induction and, mm -hmm. and capture more semantics like possession and negation and some of these other types of things, would you, uh, need to go more into doing, you know, grammatical dependency types of relationships rather than the span-based representations? Yeah, of or? course. Um, so um, we've actually been thinking about uh, doing similar things for uh, these natural language inference-based tasks where uh, relationships between words is um, shown to be enough to uh, predict uh, inference relationships between um, these hypotheses and premises. And that is where the syntactic dependency scaffolds is uh, hoped to help the most. Because, um, yeah, you're not, um, when it, it really depends on the task. So here we had two span based tasks. And so we saw that these span based scaffolding things help. But it really depends on the end task. So you typically want to, if you want to do very good multitask learning, you typically want to learn structures which are kind of similar. But there is nothing to say that if you learn from different structures, you can't uh, get anything. I don't have experimental results to show that, but it's also possible. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I was just curious if you've done uh, only POS tagging as as the other objective instead of constituency. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, 
So there has been related work that does uh, POS tagging uh, as one of the tasks in this multitask learning scenario. We did not do that because we were um, more interested in these uh, more complicated structural tasks. But people have used POS as one of the, maybe the auxiliary part of the scaffolding tasks. There's work from Joav Goldberg and others who have done similar things and saw improvements. Um, uh, but yeah, that's uh, also another alternative, right? Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.